Good morning and thank you for being with us. Welcome to US Arab Radio. This is Khalil Hashim with the Local Connections. Thank you for being with us. We have a great program for you today. This week, America is celebrating its independence. This is the holiday that has become synonymous with barbecue and fireworks. This year, we wanted to explain to our community what the holiday is all about and uh, what is it about and how it came about as well. With us this morning is Dr. Hal Friedman. He's a professor of history at Henry Ford College. Dr. Friedman, good morning, and thank you for being with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. We appreciate it. So what is what is 4th of July? Well, I, I'm not sure that the answer is going to satisfy your, your listeners if they're asking, what is the 4th of July? Because like a lot of other things in American society and culture, the 4th of July, I think, is to some extent what we make it. There, there are obviously some some basic ingredients to the holiday. Um, flying the flag outside the house uh, is is an old tradition. Um, attending a parade, um, especially if you're in the military or uh, have a relative in the military, or as I used to do years ago, if you have if you have a child, a son in my case, who is in a school band, they are in a parade um barbecues um concerts uh like the televised concerts on pbs every year uh those have become uh traditions in the 20th century with radio and and film and tv uh but and and i think the barbecues were probably became a tradition in the 20th century because barbecue of course was an old american indian cooking tradition that turned into an American Southern tradition, and then gradually, by the 1900s, became national. So I don't think I don't think uh, the founding fathers were barbecuing, uh, <laughs> but but certainly parades, uh, toasts, picnics, uh, those kinds of activities were very early on. Uh, but to some extent, you know, like a lot of our holidays and a lot of our traditions, given that we are an immigrant society, going back 400 years, really. Um, the 4th of July, to some extent, is what you make it. Uh, your particular group, uh, your particular, even sometimes individual tastes. I don't know if your listeners have ever seen or watched the the old Magnum P.I. series yes, from the yeah. 1980s yes. with Tom yeah. Selleck. Yeah. And if you'll remember, in that series, uh, Magnum spends the 4th of July alone every single year kayaking. Yes. Uh, why? because his father was killed on July 4th, 1951, shot down over North Korea. And so that's how he winds up sp spending his holiday. Now, we don't know how many individuals do things like that, because when they do things as individuals, they're just alone. But I think uh, the 4th of July, to some extent, is what your, what your individual tastes, what your family, what your community or neighborhood, and, and uh, maybe even what your immigrant group or your or ethnic group or racial group um, or sometimes even generation makes it. Um, my wife and I spent many fourths of July with a cousin of mine, and she and her husband lived on uh, uh, White Lake in um, Oakland County. And of course, what are people doing on lakes? There are dozens and dozens and dozens of boats yes. uh, out on lakes, um, not to mention the fireworks. Um, sometimes they're uh, foolishly drinking while they're on their boats. Uh, or as my as my son said when he was about nine years old, wow, Dad, those teenagers are sure having a good time on that boat. And yes, they <laughs> were. Um, so I think the Fourth of July, you know, basically being, um, you know, a, a holiday, a federal and national holiday is what you make of it. Uh, of course, I'm sure it's changed. I can't confirm this, but I'm guessing that in the 17 and 1800s, and probably even before World World War II. Um, if able to, people took the day off. I doubt they had the long weekends like we're probably going to have with this one. I mean, this, year, this one's yeah, on a yeah. Thursday. I'm yeah. assuming that every kind, kind of like a a, a a mini holiday season in December, everything is going to I think shut down for about four days. Um, and if you're if you're interested in getting work done, you're probably not going to. Uh, you're probably going to be pretty frustrated exactly. uh, mm -hmm. this weekend. Um, and I would imagine next year it'll be on a, be on a Friday. So again, we'll have kind of a long weekend and a long weekend, of course, is really a post-World War II, uh, kind of phenomenon that was created. I don't think people had 
long weekends on farms or when they worked in factories and and uh, before labor unions created holidays and things like that. Um, some myths of the of the Fourth of July. The the document was actually approved by the Continental Congress on July second. So John Adams just assumed that July 2nd would become the national holiday. It wound up becoming July 4th because the document wasn't fully edited until July 4th. Um, and the July 2nd approval was after, I think the Continental Congress made something like 85 revisions to Jefferson's original manuscript. I think he was, I think he was actually quite insulted that they had, they had scribbled everything out and written sure, margins sure. and changed all kinds of things. So the document went through quite a process. Um, and most signers did not sign it until early August. Um, and I'm not sure what that delay is. There was, there was some delay in getting members of Continental Congress to Philadelphia by that summer, because of course they had to travel from all over at a time when you could cover maybe about 25 miles a day on horseback or carriage. Uh, but they're obviously all there by June or so, June or early July. Uh, but they didn't sign it until early August. So if you look at, it, I think it's Jonathan Trumbull's uh, portrait of the signers all together in Independence Hall signing the document all on July 4th. The painting's rather mythical. Um, I think they signed it in August as they managed to make their way into Independence Hall to sign the document. I don't think they were all grouped together um, all at the same time. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, July 4th didn't become the holiday until 1870. Uh, so it took, it took Congress some time, uh, to pass an act to make the law. It reminds me of the story of the, the Star Spangled Banner, which was created in 1814. But, and I was, I was rather shocked when I found this out. Congress did not make it the national anthem until 1931. Wow. And I, I had no idea it was that late in our yeah. history. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just assumed it became the national anthem in 1814. So these holidays, you know, kind of progress and evolve. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a good less, lesson, not only not only for your listeners, but I think for, for Americans in general, these documents that we created, like the Declaration of Independence, like the U.S. Constitution, I mean, there's an old debate about to what extent we should literally read these documents or take into account our own time period. And I think it's a really significant lesson that the founding fathers never assumed us to interpret these documents as written in stone and unchangeable. They, they assumed that our interpretation of these documents, who's included in, in the clubhouse, who can vote, who's considered an American, these things were going to change. In fact, the founding fathers even thought there needed to be another constitutional convention probably about 50 years after theirs because they assumed the country would change so much that the constitution wouldn't be an effective way of managing the country. Sure. They assumed there had to be an entirely new document. Yeah. So it's, it's rather a myth that, that they thought that this was an un unchangeable document that could, that could never be uh, transformed. Um, so when, when we read, you know, all men are created equal, I think, I think it's fair to say, I think, I hope, the majority of the American population now reads that as all people are created equal. All people, exactly. Men as in, as in people. It's not, yeah. not men as, in, as people in general. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, this, is, this is really what's, what's really unique about America is that everything has evolved into what we have today, you yeah. know, which is really important. So do we know when fireworks became part of this holiday? Oh, I, I don't offhand, but I would, I would guess probably late 1700s. Yeah. Um, because I think the technology was, was still around. Uh, if, if one of the listeners has more, more, um, uh, more up to date information, then, then hopefully they can email it in. Sure. Um, but I would imagine late 1700s, uh, John Adams talked on July 2nd about the day being marked by fireworks. So I would imagine it's something that, uh, in addition to picnics and everything else, I would imagine it came in fairly early. Um, I'm sure they didn't have the, the, the pyrotechnics that we have today, sure, um, sure. especially the the computer controlled yes. uh, uh, firework displays, like we we can probably see on PBS this weekend uh, or in our own communities. Um, but I would imagine that was one of the, one of the early sure. one of the early major aspects of the holiday. 
Let's uh, back up a little bit. And, and sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, why did white Europeans come to the New World? Well, they really, they really came as agents of empire. I mean, they really came as Euro Europeans. Really came as agents of their monarchs, who were constantly, constantly engaged in uh, contests of power uh, in the old world. Um, and they were constantly seeking to find uh, new sources of things that they could exploit. Gold, silver, diamonds, spices. Um, they were in, a, in an economic system, the, the different monarchies, called mercantilism, where they were in strategic competition with each other. And so the monarch who controlled the greater sources of raw materials and economic products could obviously have a stronger economy. And if you have a stronger economy, you have a stronger monarchy and empire. You have a bigger military, you have more diplomatic leverage in the world. And so it, it actually became, I mean, Columbus was searching for China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, People in the old world did not know that the Western Hemisphere existed. Um, they knew the world was round. Uh, Arab and Muslim scholars had fully mm -hmm. determined that in the mm -hmm. Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they did, they also didn't know the Western Hemisphere existed. So they took the earth to be 17,000 miles around in circumference, mm -hmm. which is about 8,000 miles off. And if you, if you stick the Western Hemisphere in, then you get the 25,000. So, Columbus sure. thought he was headed for China uh, and what the Europeans called the East Indies, and he smacked into the Caribbean islands. And once the European monarchs understood that there was an entirely new hemisphere, there's an entirely new set of territories to be conquered uh, and settled and exploited, uh, then you, have, you start having the contests between the different colonial powers for the conquest of, of the Americas. Um, and you start bringing in, you start, you start enslaving American Indians to exploit things in Central and South America, like gold and silver. But then you start bringing in African American slaves, African slaves, I should say, um, to exploit things in North America where there's no gold or silver, but you can grow things like cotton and indigo and, um, and things like that. Um, this all becomes sources of profit, obviously, for merchants, but that all gets funneled into the, the strategic calculus of, of power competition by the monarchs. If your if your monarchs, I'm sorry, if your merchants can corner the market on particular products, you as the mark, you as the mark, as the monarch, uh, will corner the market by taxing them. Sure. And you transform your tax revenue into bigger armies, bigger navies, and the conquest of more territory. So coming here basically was part of a, uh, like a colonial, uh, yeah. you know, colonial project, basically. Yeah. Very much so. Americans came to the, you know, to, to this, this North America. Yeah. Yes. For, again, for the, it depends on who you were talking to. For the monarchs, it's colonial competition. Yes. For the merchants, it's about profit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For individuals, it's about getting out of or getting away from whatever situation in the old world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was harming them or not satisfying them. Mm -hmm. It was it was very difficult in old Europe, for instance, and and I would imagine this might have been the case in in the Middle East or or in Asia, other parts of Asia. It was very difficult in Europe for individuals to own land if they were commoners, mm -hmm. if they weren't mm -hmm. aristocrats. Mm -hmm. Well, what's North America? Yeah. It's huge. I mean, the, the current state of Texas is the size of the entire nation of France. That's true. That's true. So, so if you're a land starved European, um, you probably don't think you're coming to the colonies or the United States as part of an agent of an empire. Um, you are probably coming to get land, which you can't obtain in, um, in Europe. Um, with early Arab America, Arab uh, immigrants in the late 1800s, uh, there was really grinding poverty in Syria, yeah, uh, where they mainly came from, present-day area of Lebanon, uh, and 
what did they know about? They knew about this place over the horizon where the streets were supposedly paved with gold. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I'll head to North America. Um, my paternal, my paternal grandfather came in 1900 for a di very different reason. Um, he was a Lithuanian Jew who had gotten his draft notice from the Imperial Russian Army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Imperial Russian Army had a policy for sending Jewish recruits to Siberia. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ruben Friedlander was a 20-year-old, and I guess he wanted to make it to 21 or 25. <laughs> and so he bribed his way out of the Russian Empire into the German Empire and then caught up bought a ship in Danzig for New York yeah, City. Yeah. So, yeah, people have, and that, by the way, was a very common reason for European men coming to the United States in the 1800s. They were avoiding military drafts mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in their country. For people from the Middle East, I think it was primarily economic. Economics, was, yeah. To a great yeah. extent, merchants. Some, later on, some conflicts, as you well know, but oh, yeah. early on, economics and, and yeah. just uh, things were, were not going well overseas. No. And, and no. their families are here, and they're doing well, and they're thriving. Yeah. So th this is why they yeah. came. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, usually. From, yeah, from as you well know, from Iraq. Uh, you know, uh, some of the earlier uh, Chaldeans they came here for economics. Other yeah. Iraqis came here because of the conflict. So you know, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, early on, it was it was usually a, a male merchant coming over, <clears throat> and once settled and established, bring the family over, and then the extended families. And, and exactly. So exactly. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, uh, Dr. Friedman, we're going to take a short break. We'll be uh, right okay. back. Stay tuned. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. In a perfect world, everyone would be a perfect driver. Hands at nine and three, everyone. Nine and three. Everyone would follow all the rules. Please, go ahead and merge. I'll make room. Thank you, fellow driver. And nothing unexpected would ever happen. Even the squirrels would know the right time to safely cross the road. In this perfect world, you wouldn't have to wear a seatbelt. But in case you hadn't noticed, we don't live in a perfect world. About a thousand people in Michigan die each year in vehicle crashes, and thousands more are injured. Wearing your seatbelt reduces your risk of death in a crash by 45% in a car and by 60% in a pickup truck. So until we find a perfect world to drive in, make our imperfect world safer by buckling up. A message from the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. Life for Relief and Development has now been rated as one of the best charities for humanitarian aid. Life's humanitarian projects span the globe, and Life is celebrating its 30th anniversary of providing essential life-saving aid to people and communities in 36 countries, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. Where there is life, there is hope. And when disaster occurs here or around the world, including being one of the first responders to the Turkey-Syria earthquake crisis, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. We are looking to help the earthquake victims and we take 0% overhead on emergency donations. So please help improve these efforts. Learn more about our involvement to help the helpless and bring hope where it's needed most and make your tax-deductible donation to Life for Relief and Development now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. That's 248-424-7493. Are you going to start a restaurant or a grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? 
Call Nachi Abood at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Nachi Abood now, 734-744-9796. New Concept Products and Design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New Concept Products and Design, new location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Abood, 734-744-9796. Welcome back and thank you for being with us. We're talking to Dr. Friedman about uh, 4th of July and what it means. So when, historically, when did they these uh, white Europeans start having problems with natives? I mean, it, it, you know, historically people say they discovered America. America was already, there were already people living here. Yeah. yeah. It's not like they discovered <laughs> land there was nobody in you know, nobody is living. There were people living here. You know, there were, uh, yeah. you know, some studies I've seen. You know, millions and millions of uh, Native Americans oh, yeah. here. Yeah. When did they start really having problems yeah. with Native Americans? I think I think in the beginning, if I'm not mistaken, they they had really uh, good relations, and then didn't, things didn't it, go well. It depended on on which European powers colonists you were talking about. Um, conflict started very early between the Indian tribes uh, or the Indian communities, really usually towns or villages and the Spanish conquistadors because the Spanish conquistadors were particularly aggressive with searching for El Dorado. Uh, where, where is the city where the streets are paved with gold? Uh, they were particularly aggressive about trying to, Spanish were particularly aggressive about trying to convert the Indians to Christianity. So the, the conflict started very early on. Um, with other with other groups, um, you see conflicts early on, but it depends on the on the imperial power you're talking about. There is some cooperation between the English and the Indian tribes in and around the Chesapeake Bay area of Virginia, for instance, um, because frankly the English needed them. They didn't know how to farm early on mm -hmm. in North America, mm -hmm. and they were starving to death. They were extraordinarily dependent on Indian corn. But as soon as the English in those areas um, obtained enough people and therefore power, then you start seeing conflicts over, over land acquisition. Um, there were early conflicts between the French and the Algonquian tribes in, in uh, the St. Lawrence River Valley. Um, but after several decades, it settled down into the French probably having the best relations with the North American Indian tribes of any European colonial power. Now, why was that? Because New France was outnumbered 10 to 1 by the English colonies, and the French needed the Indians as diplomatic and military allies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe still no great love loss between the two groups, but strategic need. Um, and very often when when Indian, when groups of Indians or tribes of Indians, or or even sometimes they, they called themselves or were labeled nations, by the Europeans, when they had good diplomatic relations with a European power, it was because they were obtaining something, usually technology, uh, firearms, at, or other kinds of metal implements, because the American Indian, North American Indians, could not make metal implements on their own, other than the Indians in the UP of Michigan, who had somehow mastered making copper. Copper, yes, yes. Um, Important to understand, though, that strategic competition in North America uh, was rife between the Indian groups as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, sometimes, sometimes in a way that's that's really typical in international relations that we don't hear about. Um, in 1742, the Six Nations of the Iroquois were, which was an extraordinarily powerful group, were tired of English settlers. Um, traipsing over their territory. They signed a treaty with the British Empire handing over Shawnee and Delaware land to the British Empire mm -hmm. without the Shawnee or the Delaware ever being consulted about, about the matter at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was, this was a secret deal. So while, you know, in, I think in schools and even in colleges, we focus on the really horrible relations that were created between groups of Europeans and, and political entities of Indians. And we shouldn't ignore those. 
we should also understand that there were very often really, really bitter conflicts between different Indian political entities as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we call him Indian is because uh, Christopher Columbus thought he was coming to India? Right, right. Okay. okay. And I, I, in my classrooms, I don't use the words indigenous or native because, um, frankly, indigenous means you've been here since the beginning of time and no one's been here since the beginning of time. Uh, the various Indian groups came here somewhere between twenty to 30,000 years ago. Uh, as far as we can tell with archaeology, um, native is is more a 20th century creation. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, when I'm teaching early American history, I try to identify the particular Indian group I'm talking about by by tribal designation or ethnic designation, because Indian groups usually come down through through ethnic groupings um, or maybe later political designations, the Six Nations of the Iroquois, for instance. Uh, that way, I think my students have a better idea uh, of who we're talking about. I mean, some, calling someone American Indian, even though I use the phrase a lot in my classrooms, is about as overgeneralized as calling someone a European sure. uh, or, or an Asian or an African. So I introduce these terms to my students, um, and um, but, I, but I try to get them into as many specifics as we can in, say, 16 weeks of a, of a semester. Yeah, yeah. So over the years, uh, Europeans uh, that came here decided to create colonies, and yeah. I think it was thirteen colonies, if I'm not mistaken. The British did, yeah. Yeah, the, the British. British did, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then these colonies uh, were like uh, specific territories divided into. I mean, people did did really people know where the areas are and everything, like states. No, like the the geography was a little fuzzy. Okay. Um, and and in fact, um, you know the the textbook publishers are starting to get away from this fortunately but i think we're probably all familiar with those early american maps in textbooks that showed the really clear boundaries of the 13 colonies versus new france um or new netherlands or new spain and and in fact if you look at a map of north america anywhere from the 1500s to about 1815 understand the vast majority of North America was controlled by various Indian groups. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of them very large and, and powerful. I mean, the, the Dakota, the Dakota Sioux Indians on the Northern Plains were a huge empire. Um, and there were others like that. Um, I started using textbooks and, and in the, in the old days, the 1990s, uh, overhead transparencies from those textbooks because um, some of them started coloring in where the actual European and European American settlements were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you look at a map of North America up to say 1750, they're basically no further west than the Appalachian mountain range. If you look at a map of 1815, they're, they're just starting to reach into what's today the American Midwest. Mm -hmm. The rest of the continent with a few exceptions here and there, is Indian controlled. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're talking about, if we're talking about the colonial period of North American history being, say, the 1500s to the 1800s, the various groups of Indians don't really start losing territorial control until the early to mid 1800s. Um, and a lot of that's diseases, because diseases kill off about uh, depending on the time period and the, and the portion, about 40 to 60 percent of the original populations, Indian populations in North America. Um, and it's I, I don't I don't think consider this a genocide. It's, I don't consider it biological warfare because the Europeans don't know much more about diseases than the Indians do. But it winds up being a sort of byproduct strategic weapon because if the Indian tribes are your enemies in conquering North America, sure, um, and forty to sixty percent of them are gone, you have a tremendous advantage. Uh, especially the the populations of these European colonies and the early United States are going up and up and up and up and up. There's yeah. immigration. There's also incredible birth rates. I mean, the thirteen colonies have a population of two and a half million in 1775. The early United States has a population of 5 million 
1800, and then 10 million in 1820. So it's doubling about every generation from a combination of high birth rate, longer lifespan than in the old world, uh, and immigration. There's an estimated 5 million Indians in, in North America in 1500, but there's only an estimated 1 million by 1800. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if you're looking at territorial conquest and settlement and you're a European power or the early United States, this is a tremendous advantage to, and a yeah, tremendous yeah. disadvantage yeah. if you're if you're an Indian yeah. tribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to take another break. Uh, please stay tuned. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bonham serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all seafood. CDC guidelines and is open every day, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. With more than 30,000 successful in vitro fertilizations, IVF Michigan is now ranked as one of America's best fertility clinics according to Newsweek magazine. IVF Michigan fertility centers are the recognized leaders in high quality fertility care. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and nine other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. A founding member, American Board Certified Dr. Nicholas Shama, is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. He has performed over 20,000 successful IVF cases and it's helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. When it's time to get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at one of America's best fertility clinics, call IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio toll free at 855-952-9600. 855-952-9600. What's my ETA? Your estimated time of arrival is 9:17. I'm late. I'll have to punch it. Speeding will save you just 1 minute and 36 seconds. It will also increase your risk of a crash, as well as the odds that you will be stopped and issued an expensive speeding ticket. Yeah, but... In one year, there were 22,000 speeding-related crashes in Michigan, resulting in 200 deaths. If I had someone in the car with me, I'd drive slower. But it's just me. This is not a logical response. Though you have no passenger, surrounding cars contain 27 others, including five children and one Labrador retriever. (laughs) How do you know all this stuff? I know everything, Kevin. Your risk of a crash increases with every mile you drive over the speed limit. So slow down. Speed enforcement is happening now. A message from the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. Ziad Brand. Quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. Hey, Michigan drivers, are you sending or answering group chats behind the wheel, checking emails at the light, calling family or friends on the commute? Michigan's hands-free law makes it illegal to manually use electronic devices while behind the wheel of a vehicle. Breaking the law could mean fines or even community service. Go hands-free, just drive. It's the law. Learn more at michigan.gov slash distracted driving. A message from the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning. Welcome back, and thank you for being with us. We're talking to Dr. Friedman uh, uh, about the history of the uh, uh, 4th of July and uh, talking a little bit more, reaching back a little bit about American history. At what, you know, why, since th- everything was working for them, and that's white European, why did they decide to separate from the monarch in, in specifically England? And did they really fight the battle with them? Well, it's, it's, I mean, the causes of the American Revolution are still being debated. Um, the, 
the argument I always made to my students uh, is that both the British and the colonists began to have misperceptions about each other, which, which I, as a historian of international relations, I think is probably the most basic cause for wars between nations and groups. Sure, sure. Um, the British were, the British had, uh, and their colonists had defeated the French Empire in uh, what was called the Seven Years or the French and Indian War. And the British had acquired control over the St. Lawrence River Valley and uh, all the French forts in the Mississippi River and Great Lakes region. The the various Indian tribes were still in control of the rest of what the French had been claiming as their empire. But the British suddenly had a, a really vast new set of territories to govern. And they also had an incredible debt from the war. They had, they had doubled their national debt. And British taxpayers paid really high taxes mm -hmm. in the 1700s. Um, British colonists paid next to nothing in taxes. And so the British Parliament thought about raising some taxes. And, these, and contrary to our national mythology, these were not onerous taxes. This, they would not have ruined the colonists. But what, what angered the colonists wasn't so much the taxes or the rate of taxation. It was the fact that Parliament could make laws without the colonists having any say in the lawmaking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or the policy process or the or the management or administration of the laws the british on the other hand once the colonists started resisting the laws based on this political idea uh the british empire did what empires do they tried to assert their authority um how how dare the colonists protest parliament uh parliament's parliament makes laws for the empire and everything that Parliament or the colonists did uh, on the one hand or the other in the 1760s and 70s looked to the other side worse than the intention really was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do the colonists want? They really don't want independence. They do, they do not want to break away from the British Empire. But they want representation in Parliament. In the, in the British never, Parliament. The British Parliament. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, yeah. Each of the 13 colonies had their own parliament. Yeah. They want representation in British the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. British Parliament thinks that's absolutely ridiculous. Colonies mm -hmm. do not make laws for the empire. The empire makes laws for the empire. Um, and so, you know, how do the British react to the protesting? Well, you send redcoats to Boston to police the population where most of the protests are. Well, the Redcoats are seen as agents of empire and to be resisted. And so you have the Boston Massacre. And every time one side or the other ups the ante, the other side thinks the absolute worst about the other side. And as I tell my students, those of whom are old enough to have watched Star Trek, since each side can't Vulcan mind meld with each other, yeah, and you think the worst about the other side, you prepare for the worst. Yes. Well, if you prepare for the worst, the other side thinks the worst is going to happen. And before you know it, you've got colonial militia exchanging live rounds with British redcoats at Lexington and Concord. Um, but it is important to understand that, that most colonists, right up until about probably 1773, 1774, do not want to break away from the empire. They are very proud in the 1760s to be part of the British Empire and to call themselves British. Um, and Paul Revere on his famous ride does not go through the countryside saying the British are coming, the British are coming. Because the colonists identified themselves as British and they wouldn't sure. have known what the hell he's talking about. Exactly. He said the red coats are coming. The red that <laughs> that's what made sense. Yeah. Um, also I think it's important for the for the listeners to understand the American Revolution was not one big tax revolt. Um, again, the, the taxes only came into play because there were laws that Parliament was trying to impose on the colonies. That's what it was about. It was a political fight over power sure. uh, more than any of it. Yeah. And then finally uh, yeah. uh, decided, OK, it's time to declare independence from from the. Uh, you know. Yes. And it took a and again, it, it took a couple of British actions. Um the the British colonial governor of Virginia 
a military officer named Lord Dunmore made, shall we say, a, a, a strategic miscalculation. He decided to put out a proclamation in 1775 that if Africans and African Americans who were enslaved would come to fight for the British against the rebelling colonies, they would obtain freedom. Now, during the War of American Independence, the British sometimes gave people of color who fought for them freedom and sometimes didn't. But this was a proclamation that Dunmore put out. And the American Southern colonies, which had large numbers of slaves, took this to be particularly dangerous. North Carolina, for instance, had a 90% Black population, the vast, vast majority of whom were slaves. So if your slaves are fighting for the British, you are not only going to lose property as an individual, you're probably going to lose that portion of, of the colonies to mm -hmm. the British because of the large Black population. And the British Empire is also... Um, has has forged strong diplomatic ties with American Indian tribes because colonial Americans want Indian land, but the British Empire doesn't want Indian land, not not directly. Uh, also, uh, the the British start hiring German mercenaries called Hessians mm -hmm. to supplement their army. They not only they not only send a fleet with an army to North America to quell Boston and try to quell the, the, the rebellion. Uh, but uh, the king and parliament are hiring German mercenaries who the colonists think are going to do the worst possible things to them uh, if they come to the, to the 13 colonies. Actually, most of the German mercenary soldiers who came and fought in the American Revolution and survived, a huge numbers of them stayed in the early United States became American citizens, <laughs> their families are still here. But but the fear in 1775 was, oh no, German mercenaries mm -hmm. are coming to get us. And, and there became a really, really quick rage against George III and Parliament over things like Lord Dunmar's proclamation and the German mercenaries and and the, the British Navy and Army being sent to North America. If King, this is all still being explored. It's very, very complex and very, very difficult to figure out. But if King George V, if King George III is the head of the British family, i.e. the British Empire, and you're, you as colonists are part of the British Empire, King George III is your political father. Fathers aren't supposed to abuse their children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if the king is sending soldiers and German mercenaries and a fleet and blockading harbors and allowing Lord Dunmar to make his proclamation and cutting diplomatic deals with Indian tribes, um, then he must not be a very good father. And what do you do with a bad father? Uh, uh, well, you know, at least before the age of retirement homes, when you can stick them in a bad retirement home, uh, you rebel. And you so them, yeah. Yeah. really quickly in 1774, 1775, there is this idea of rebelling against the king, pulling down his statues that are that are in the colonial capitals and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. um, no, obviously no longer celebrating his birthday as a national holiday. Uh, in fact, why do you have Independence Day? It's the replacement oh, for the celebrating king, yeah. the monarch's yeah. birthday. Yeah. yeah. Which was the British national holiday. Yeah. Um, and and historians are still researching and writing and exploring and wondering why does this happen so quickly in 1774, 1775? I really I really don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah. 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 Um it's it's just one of those was, phenomena that we're still was exploring. there like a specific battle in which England lost and it was like okay that's over and 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 then the colonies uh, succeeded. Well, the Battle of Yorktown in 1781 is usually designated as such because an entire an entire British army of about I think seven thousand men about about a quarter of all the British troops in North America had to surrender to to George Washington. 
and uh, General Rochambeau of the French French army. Um, and when you lose a quarter of your army, even though they're they're yeah. still alive and they're prisoners, you lose a quarter of your army, you have to start thinking about peace negotiations. And that's the point where Parliament decided, okay, we'll start negotiating with with the well, they're still calling them the 13 colonies. The sure. Americans are calling themselves the United States. Yeah. But Parliament decides, okay, we you know, we've been at this for six years, over six years. It's gone nowhere. We've spent all this money, lost all these lives. I guess we're going to have to cut the, the colonies loose. But it's important to understand that Yorktown was in October 1781. The treaty ending the war wasn't until April 1783. So there was another year and a half of fighting that continued, especially guerrilla-like fighting between different groups of Americans, because only about 40% of the American population were Continentals. About another 20% were loyalists. They stayed loyal to, to the British Empire. British Empire, yeah. And both of these groups were armed. Mm -hmm. And they continued to fight each other in various actions throughout the, the Atlantic seaboard. Um, by the way, that leaves about 40% of the American population, which was neutral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They never, they never took sides in the American Revolution. They tried to stay out of the conflict. And, until I think recent decades, I don't think we've done a very good job of teaching those percentages because those mm -hmm. percentages are really important to keep in mind. Yes, this was a popular revolution, but it wasn't, it wasn't a 90 or 100 percent population, uh, popular revolution. Yeah. That led to, you know, the British, uh, deciding it's over. And then the, you know, the, the colony, yeah. the colonies or they call, you know, here the leaders decided we succeeded and, and then right. they formed what we know today is the United States. Yeah. Or, or, or the seed of what we know today is the United oh, States. It was, it was the United States. I mean, I mean, we declare, I, I take the U.S. to be in existence as of July 2nd or July 4th, 1776, mm -hmm. whether it's recognized as such by other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, occasionally uh, you'll, you'll see a 20th century movie where someone from Britain arrives in the United States and, you know, well, how, how are things in the colonies these days? You know, well, it's, <laughs> wait a minute, it's 1953. Know. Um, you know, so let's yeah. get with it. Uh, yeah. But but no, I mean, the Americans take themselves to be the U.S., I think, from 1776 on. Yeah. They don't get the U.K. to recognize them as such until the treaty in 1783. Um, and then they start trying to establish diplomatic relations with, with various European powers as a way of getting those European powers to to recognize them. But some of them did before. I mean, France recognizes an independent United States in 1778. Um, the British, I think, probably, or the Dutch, I think, probably in the same year, if not before. Um, it all depended on what your political interests were. Sure. If you're the British, you never really want to recognize the United States. Yeah. Um, if you're the French and you're mm -hmm. going to assist the United States because you hate the British, you're going to recognize the U.S. as soon as you know interest, it's going to be yeah. around. Yeah, competing. Uh, the, the enemy of my enemy is my ally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from 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 then on, you know, the United States developed into eventually what we have today and yeah. civil war and whatever. Then the yeah. defeat is what we have today, right? You know, right now, growing population, um, and and conquest of territory with that growing population. Because we had, we had a in our first decades we had a pretty small army uh, and a pretty small navy, and to some extent we we conquered territory from the Indians by by just avalanches of settlers going out. I mean, ninety five percent of the early American population were farmers, and so what did they want? They wanted land. Um, so rising population, greater territory. Land which was extraordinarily rich in in water, in raw materials, so a phenomenal agricultural economy that eventually leads to a phenomenal industrial economy, and then and then from that industrial economy, once the Civil War is over with, um, and once once the U.S. has conquered out to the West Coast, <laughs> excuse me, um, the idea of exporting American values overseas mm -hmm. and at times conquering territory overseas um 
And sometimes these were for very laudable motives, and often they were for very greedy and selfish motives. Um, and although Americans are really loath to call themselves an empire, um, historians have been calling the U.S. an empire for probably about the last 60 years. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of empire. It becomes much more of a, of a sort of like a hegemony. commercial empire yeah, yeah, than yeah. a territorial one. Um, although we do have we do have territories in the Caribbean and and the Pacific still, um, and I think to some extent in the 20th century it becomes a cultural empire because the U.S.'s economy is so powerful and its political influence becomes so powerful, and even at times its material goods are so desired by by people in other countries. Um, Jeans the, and the, McDonald's. The, the French, as early as the 1920s, complained that they were being invaded by the Americans. They did not. They did not mean soldiers. They did not mean colonial administrators. Uh, they meant Coca-Cola and hamburgers and and uh, uh, clothing uh, and jazz music uh, and things like that. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 amazing how it really moved uh, to what we have today. Oh, and yeah. as you said, you know, Americans don't accept the fact that they're they're an imperial. You know, country, but uh, the hegemony over you know, different areas. How many? I mean, we have like twenty-something bases overseas. Oh no, 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 no much more than that. We have yeah, several hundred. Than that. We, yeah. we actually have, I think, around eight hundred uh, oh, military okay. installations. Yeah, uh, yeah, more more than during the Cold War. Now, you know, the the concept of empire is interesting. Um, before uh, the U.S.'s disastrous invasion of Iraq in two thousand three. Um, who would who would be using the word empire or imperial when it came to the United States? Well, historians did yeah, pretty typically yeah. in two thousand. Well, some Russians, political scientists, probably, yeah, probably yeah. some Russians, probably yeah. the Chinese. Yeah, I don't think Americans did in general. But you know, after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and my my conclusion here is more anecdotal than systematic. I haven't done systematic research in this. But I notice a lot of journalists and newspapers, news agencies, yes. beginning to use the word empire and imperial yes. when it came to, and even at times some government agencies. So I think small e empire or small i imperial has become a little more acceptable in American lexicon now in the wake of Afghanistan and Iraq than it was before. In 1995, I, I uh, defended my dissertation at Michigan State, and uh, I had the word, I had the phrase U.S. imperialism in the subtitle of my dissertation, and my dissertation director took me aside and said, and, and jobs were not easy to get in academia. Then. Sure. I mean, a little easier than they are now. It's really difficult now, but not, not easy. He took me aside and he said, are you sure you want that phrase in the subtitle of your dissertation? This could cost you a job. And I, and I have to tell you from personal experience that when I interviewed with the history department at the U.S. Naval Academy, they weren't exactly enamored of my my idea of labeling yeah. the U.S. an imperial power yeah. in the 1940s. At Henry Ford Community College, I don't think they really cared. They just wanted to know that I was a good classroom teacher sure. um, and, and what I did for my scholarship was up to me. But it it was, I think, until recently, sometimes even in, in academic circles, um, a rather... Um, a rather controversial term to use. I think it's a little more acceptable now. What? Why, why do you think they don't want to? Ex, you know, a good number of Americans don't want to accept the fact that they are imperialist. Yeah. Well, I think because we came from an empire, <clears throat> and and because we were colonists of an empire, and then and then you bring in some of the Fourth of July mythology. Okay, that we were abused and tyrannized by the British Empire. Well, we really we really weren't that badly abused and and tyrannized by the British Empire until live shots were being fired. The The taxes were not onerous. Um, the laws were really not that onerous. Um, and frankly, the British 13 colonies had the highest standard of living and the most political freedoms of anybody in the British Empire. But once you, once you create the national mythology that we were tyrannized by an empire, and then you start becoming powerful enough to be an empire, which I would say is early 1800s, certainly by the 1840s, by the time we conquer half of Mexico from the Republic of Mexico. All right. But 
if you're the if you're the first republic in the modern world, the U.S., and you're conquering half of the territory of a sister republic, Mexico, you have to justify that somehow. And the way you do it is, well, we were victims. There's no way we could be victimizing people now. It's just not, it's just not physically. You've got to get that out of your head. It's just not physically possible. And I think that became the thinking uh, for, for most of the rest of American history. Yeah. Um, And, and obviously there were some people in some groups who didn't subscribe to that, but I think that became the general term uh i mean even historians with using they had to be careful with using the 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 term there was a biographer of thomas jefferson in the 1920s who talked about the u.s louisiana purchase being quote-unquote protective imperialism but that was really rare that's the 1920s really rare you Mm -hmm. instead saw historians using phrases like expansionism um and and in, in the typical american textbook well the European settlers came to North America and they and they settled. Well, <laughs> what is that exactly does that mean? That's true. If they're occupying somebody else's territory, yeah. you gotta conquer somebody else's territory. Yeah. And but but we we really rarely use the words conquer or imperial. We used words like settlement. Absolutely. Um, historians might still be subscribing to this a little bit. One of the one of the major theses right now is the US as a settler colonial nation well, what does settler colonialism mean i mean it, i mean it, it really means imperialism but they're not using the word imperialism yeah. um there was one canadian historian who wrote about u.s manifest destiny being quote-unquote defensive expansionism <laughs> because from a from a u.s perspective when we <clears throat> move out into new territory we're doing it for defensive purposes exactly Unless, unless you can sit in the other person's chair intellectually and realize, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, this act, this defensive action of ours might be really aggressive and offensive. Um, but, but if you don't preemptive, let's uh, yeah, yeah, preemptive, preemptive, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but unless you can, unless you can see the other side, and that's what I spent a lot of time in my classrooms trying to do. Okay, here's what's going on from a U.S. perspective. What's going on from a Shawnee perspective? Yeah. Uh, or a Mexican perspective, or a Guamanian perspective, or, you know, I mean, the, the current Cold War, and I do think we are in a Cold War with the People's Republic of China. And, and I, I move a lot in, in national security and military circles, and there's very much a sense of the U.S. is on the defensive when it comes to aggressive Chinese behavior in the Western Pacific. Now, I don't know this for sure because I'm not in Beijing. I can't mind meld with the Politburo. But I would guess in Beijing, the Politburo probably sees everything the U.S. is doing in the Western Pacific to counter their moves as aggressive and imperialistic. Exactly. Exactly. I, I'm sure both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And and that then you get into the miscommunication. And hopefully, in this case, the miscommunication doesn't lead to a shooting war because both the U.S. and the PRC have nuclear weapons. That's a big change since the, for the yeah. original Fourth of July. <laughs> we'll le- we'll leave it to that since we're yeah. out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, those are the fireworks we'll never experience. Exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. This has been a pleasure talking to you, and I hope that we helped our community and everybody else who's listening to understand a little bit of the background of Fourth of July and how we came about to to do that. I hope so too. And, and again, you can you can celebrate it in a number of ways. Yeah. It's 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 okay to have baklava yeah. <laughs> uh, at a Fourth of July picnic if you don't want to yeah. have ice cream. I mean that's yeah, you know definitely, that's definitely. cultural pluralism. It's perfectly acceptable. Yeah. So thank you, thank, thank you, you. I really appreciate it, Dr. Hal Friedman from uh, Henry Ford College. Appreciate it.